Okay, thank you so much. Of course, I am uh, super sad not to be there in person with you all in beautiful Sicily, uh, but I am happy to be here with you nonetheless today to talk to you um, about using non-invasive brain stimulation to investigate the causal mechanisms of consciousness. And let me pull this up. Okay. I hope you can see my full screen. Someone, someone tell me if not. Um, so uh, most of the work that I'm going to talk about today was done at the Center for Consciousness Studies uh, in collaboration with Stuart Hameroff, John J.B. Allen, and others, um, as well as some work at the University of New Mexico. Um, and I do want to disclose that I have a paid salary from a company called Sanmai Technologies Public Benefit Corporation. Um, now, here at the Science of Consciousness Conference, I think many of us share the goal of discovering a general theory of consciousness so we can understand it, predict it, and explain it. And of course, we're all part of a long tradition of trying to investigate consciousness and its relationship to the brain and the body. Um, so if, as one example, um, one of my scientific heroes, um, Wilder Penfield, drew this picture right before he passed away. Uh, just depicting his theory of consciousness, which was related to the brainstem and its interactions with the temporal cortex. Um, now, you probably know he was a famous neurosurgeon who was stimulating patients' brains in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And so, uh, just like Pinfield, um, I think most of us assume that the brain has something to do with consciousness. Uh, we're all coming from neurobiological frameworks. And really, like Pinfield, we're using the tools um, that we have of the day to try to advance the science and to find new facts um, that can be brought into our scientific theories um, to update our ideas about how consciousness works and hopefully to move towards a general theory of consciousness. Now, um, because of the tools of neurobiology, we've really uh, done a, a job of looking for what are called the neural correlates of consciousness. Um, now, uh, these are um, basically a set of neural, um, we're looking for the minimum set of neural mechanisms that would be sufficient to produce a conscious percept. Um, and now, important in that definition is produce a conscious percept. So there is an assumption here that I think most of us are bringing with us that the brain is causing consciousness in some sense. And we would hope that our methods that we're using and the scientific method in general would be able to address that assumption and let us know whether it is true or not. And so, um, you know, it looks something like this. We have a conscious percept. That's what we're interested in. We think that there are some minimum set of neural activities, neural firing rates, oscillations in the brain, whatever they may be, that are sufficient to produce that particular conscious percept and the contents of that conscious percept. Um, now, we are limited to the methods that we have, like functional magnetic resonance imaging, uh, EEG, and more recently, more invasive methods um, like ECOG, where you put a net of electrodes over the exposed brain. And these methods have uh, really been consistent with looking for the, cor the correlates of consciousness. Now, um, I think we're all here for a reason, which is that we have produced many neurocorrelates of consciousness and through these methods, it has produced a host of ideas, theories, and uh, meta-theories, and sets of theories. And uh, that's part of the, the, the beauty of this conference, is we're coming together to try to uh, come to some, um, some coherence about, about a general theory and about whether we're moving in the direction of that coherence. However, so far, there's no specific correlate or theory that has been accepted. And uh, that has led to lots of fun debate. Uh, many of you are probably aware that the Templeton Foundation um, just last year um, has put together an adversarial collaboration competition. So some of the major theories of consciousness were funded to collaborate and, um, and compete with each other um, to try to, um, to test which ones will survive. Um, the point here is that uh, due to the methods that we have, we've been looking for lots of different correlates of consciousness. And these methods, although important, have been generating, it seems, more theories than, um, than really the um, coherence into one major theory. And we also have other interesting theories like, um, for example, Hameroff and uh, Penrose's theory of ORCOR and other quantum theories. 
that uh, under the current methods that we have can't really distinguish between even those totally different types of theories and the more reductionist theories of the neural correlates. And so why is there so little convergence? Um, one way to look at this is to say, well, we, we're getting something fundamentally wrong. Uh, maybe the fundamental assumption that the brain um, and its activities are causing consciousness is wrong. Maybe the approaches are wrong, or maybe we're thinking fundamentally um, in the wrong way about some of these assumptions. Now, we would hope that our methods and that the scientific method in general would be able to even approach these types of claims um, and make progress on them. Uh, we also would hope that the scientific method would point out some of the flaws of the current methods. And so when you're looking at something like fMRI or EEG, um, they're essentially correlational methods, and that's why they're called neural correlates of consciousness. But fundamental to the assumption is that the brain is causing consciousness. And therefore, um, these approaches that we have so far have fundamental limitations, I think, that we all understand. And that without establishing the causal relationship between the events that we're interested in, let's say conscious perception and the neural correlates of consciousness and the conscious perception in the brain, um, it's really hard to find the minimal set of neural conditions necessary for consciousness, the condition of the neural correlates of consciousness. And so um, many researchers, and myself included, have been calling for the direct manipulation of brain activity through methods like brain stimulation, if, of course, they can be done safely, um, as an attempt to look for causal effects on conscious states and the contents of consciousness. So we could also call these the NCCs. It's the neural causes of consciousness instead of the neural correlates of consciousness. Um, and of course, brain stimulation would be one way to do this. And so this, again, is Wilder Penfield. This is from some of his studies in the 1940s, where um, he was uh, electrically stimulating the brains of epileptic patients to try to make sure um, that they weren't dissecting too much of the brain. And what he found um, with these little numbers is he was actually noting different conscious perceptions that he was inducing by stimulating those parts of the brain, and so causing a uh, participants to have hallucinations in this case. Um, now, what's nice about brain stimulation is that you can both uh, induce or inhibit uh, conscious experience if you have a focal enough stimulation system. And so any true causal logic, you would want to be, you know, in a sense, turning on and turning off the conscious perception uh, to really know that that brain region was related um, to that percept. And so, um, you know, the, the most precise way to do this is invasive brain stimulation. Um, methods including ECOG or electrocorticography have been developed um, over the past couple decades, where essentially you're putting a net of electrodes over the exposed brain. And this has been really helpful for advancing uh, the NCCs of consciousness. Um, for example, in the area of face perception, um, there was lots of debate about an area called the fusiform face area and whether it's uh, involved in face perception per se or whether it's more of a, um, an area of the brain involved in, um, in uh, being sort of an expert uh, system. Humans are experts at uh, looking at faces, for example. And so uh, in one study, they took a couple patients who were undergoing surgery and they put an ECOG system over their uh, fusiform face area, which you're seeing here, number one and number two. And then they basically turned it on and off and asked the patient what their face perception was like. So here in the sham condition, this person is looking at the, uh, the neurologist in this case, and they're saying nothing's happening. When they turn the stimulator on and it's stimulating the fusiform face area, now you see this patient says, uh, you turned into somebody else, your face is morphing. And uh, if you watch the video from this paper, you'll actually see the patient gets kind of happy. It's kind of an interesting experience to them. Uh, they say, your face is changing. I can't recognize you anymore. And then the person says, whoa, that was kind of a trip. You know, that was interesting type of experience. Um, and so this takes it a step further from the fMRI studies that were there previously, which were unable to distinguish whether the function of the fusiform face area was actually to cause face perception um, or whether it was part of a larger network, uh, sort of an expertise network that was computing, um, you know, faces. So um, obviously, if we want a general tool that can advance the science, relying on invasive brain surgery is quite difficult. And so uh, many researchers have been turning, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> to uh, non-invasive brain stimulation, uh, which is a way to focus energy into the brain to modulate focal brain networks.
Uh, the problem with many of these methods like transcranial magnetic stimulation or electrical stimulation is they're not very focal. And to get to these types of effects, uh, you need highly focused uh, brain stimulation to really start getting at the neural correlates. And so uh, we've turned to transcranial ultrasound. I uh, actually got interested in this because of Stuart Hameroff back in 2013. And that's partly because, as you can see on the screen, you can focus a beam of sound quite precisely, um, in this case, in water and in the brain as well of animals and humans. Um, so this technique has sort of exploded over the last decade. And uh, what we're finding is, for example, in, in, in the mouse model, you can focus that beam of ultrasound energy uh, quite tightly in the brain. So they're focusing here to a subcomponent of the thalamus. And um, they're actually disrupting, if you see in black, they're disrupting the evoked potential, the somatosensory evoked potential. So it shows how focused it can be. Uh, this has been replicated in humans as well. So this is a human study um, coming out of Lagan's lab where they actually focused a beam of ultrasound down to the thalamus, so one of the deepest targets in the human brain. And they were able to focally disrupt the somatosensory evoked potential again. So it shows quite um, how focused ultrasound can be. Um, I will give a caveat at this point, it is quite hard to get ultrasound that focused across the human skull. Uh, there's aberration and absorption of the, the beam, and so there's some, some uh, engineering and physics to work out, but many labs are working on that problem, and once you, once you get that worked out, you get a much more precise non-invasive brain stimulation technology. Um, as I said, uh, Stuart Hameroff actually uh, got me interested in this technology when I was a grad student at Arizona. And actually, Stuart published the first human study uh, with ultrasound brain stimulation. We called it transcranial ultrasound. And uh, the first study to actually modulate conscious states in humans with ultrasound. And uh, like any good brain stimulation researcher, uh, Stuart went first here. So you can see Stuart on the screen with the ultrasound on his head. And basically, he found that he could uh, increase the affect or the emotional state of patients with chronic pain. And so that kind of ignited the field of, of doing this type of research in humans. And since then, uh, lots of studies have come out. So for example, this one from Lee's lab, where they focused a beam of ultrasonic energy into V1 and V2 of the visual cortex. And um, they were able to show that they could induce visual evoked potentials. But more importantly, they could induce visual phosphemes. Um, so these are like sort of visual um, experiences, visual hallucinations in the visual field that look a little bit like that on the screen. Um, thinking back to the thalamus, um, some of the major theories of consciousness um, back in the 1960s and 70s were proposing thalamocortical loops as being fundamental to consciousness. And indeed, it does seem to be the case. Uh, one group um, from Martin Monti's lab at UCLA in California um, actually focused a beam of ultrasound down into the thalamus of patients who are in coma. And in this first case study, he woke up one patient from a coma. And uh, uh, Josh Kane and his group have replicated that, um, I think, in 11 more patients with coma, able to wake them up. And so, again, this shows the ability of focused ultrasound to reach a very deep target, the thalamus in this case and modulate consciousness, actually waking people up from coma in this case. So um, to our work, uh, the, the work that I started doing with Stuart uh, Hameroff back in 2014, 2015, um, we started asking whether we could use focused ultrasound to modulate a network in the brain that we think is involved in emotional experience. And so uh, we targeted the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, um, partly because you can go through the temporal window, which is a good place for ultrasound to get through. And uh, back, in, back in 2015, 2014, when we started doing this research, it was very clear that this part of the brain was involved in response inhibition. But there was a lot of fMRI research, particularly, that was suggesting it's also involved in the regulation of negative emotion, particularly uh, involved with bipolar disorder and depression, for example, but that um, it's, it's a bit more than just response inhibition, that if you could modulate this region or regulate this region, you should increase um, positive affect. And so we tested that hypothesis by using ultrasound to target um, the right prefrontal cortex. Uh, so you can see here on the screen, we were targeting right into the VLPFC through the temporal window. And the basic finding is that we found subjects reported positive changes in mood. So the black line is basically less sadness, more happiness. Uh, global effect was changing relative to placebo. 
And interestingly, we found this effect a little bit longer than we expected in the beginning. It's lasting up to 30 minutes and comes back to baseline after about two hours. And so there is a window, it seems, of plasticity change in the system as well, where we've modulated um, how the system is regulating emotion. Um, we also targeted some control locations to make sure there's specificity to the target. And we found that by moving to the top of the head to a control location, now you don't see that effect. Um, so ultrasound to basically the interior cingulate didn't change uh, emotion. So that's important, right? Because if you're going to use a tool to really target uh, particular brain regions to study neural correlates and neural causes of consciousness, you need specificity in that tool. Uh, we also looked at uh, activation of brain networks, so targeting the right prefrontal cortex. At, at baseline, these are sort of the connected areas. It's hard to see, I know, but this region here is the target region, and these are just all the regions that are connected in the brain. After ultrasound to the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, we find uh, lots of blue, which basically means reduced connectivity to that brain region. And importantly, it was in a lot of regions that show up in fMRI studies of emotion and mood regulation. Um, so we do, we do find that by targeting with ultrasound that one brain region, uh, we lead to the mood effects that we were looking for, but also the changes in networks that we would assume from the fMRI uh, literature as well. So overall, um, we were able to show that the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex plays a causal role in regulating emotions. And for the first time, we showed that actually modulating that region upregulated positive emotions. Um, this has now been replicated by other researchers using like repetitive uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, but it shows the, the power of using that kind of tool to study um, a, a problem like that. Um, recently, uh, during the pandemic, we turned to studying the default mode network, which I'm sure everyone is quite familiar with. Um, this is a set of interconnected regions in the brain that become activated when uh, people are attending internally. Um, so mind wandering, thinking about oneself, mental time travel. Um, it's really a network that seems to be related to self-referential uh, mental activity. Some people are proposing it's where uh, the seat of conscious awareness of the self, for example. Um, I'm not sure we can go quite that far yet. But disruption of this region um, with psychedelics or meditation, for example, does tend to um, disrupt self-processing, um, particularly psychedelics. So if you take something like psilocybin, magic mushrooms, and uh, somehow you sit inside of an MRI while you're tripping, um, you do see massive disruptions in the default mode network, um, particularly a region called the posterior cingulate cortex, the main hub of the default mode network, uh, which is right here. And what's interesting is that the more disruption, so the more of a dose you take of the psilocybin, the more disruption you have to the PCC and the more sort of ego modulating effects, uh, what they call ego death or ego dissolution, uh, tends to happen. And so it's a, it's a clue from all of the fMRI literature that this region is quite involved in self and self-processing. Um, but as many of you know, there's a lot of debate about exactly what the default mode network is actually doing. And so... Um, uh, particularly involved in meditation as well, which is what we're interested in. And so we decided to modulate the default mode network in healthy subjects and ask a simple question of whether we modulate self-perception and uh, mindful states, which is eventually what uh, my lab is really interested in boosting or, or enhancing. And so uh, we used a focused ultrasound system that you see on the screen. It's navigated by uh, MRI, so structural MRIs, so you can target the particular region. And as you can see, uh, most of the energy, according to our models, um, are most of that energy of the ultrasound is entering the precuneus and the, the posterior cingulate. There is a bit of a caveat that the thick skull back here tends to pull the, pull the ultrasound beam back towards the skull. Um, and so future methods will have to try to compensate for that. But at least uh, the energy was at the intersection between the precuneus and the PCC. And the basic paradigm was to do functional uh, imaging pre and post ultrasound and see if we could disrupt the default mode network connectivity and subjective state. Uh, here's Brian Lord, grad student, Lisa Net Ruiz, uh, lab manager of the lab, um, modeling that system. And the basic finding is that post uh, stimulation, we did find um, pretty large disruptions to the default mode network, so relative to placebo. On the right, um, by targeting the 
the posterior cingulate, you see reductions in the default mode network as well as some sub-regions of the DMM. We also find this effect uh, 25 minutes post-sonication as well, post-ultrasound, uh, which is quite interesting. And uh, more interesting to us for this talk is that we find um, alterations in self-reports that are consistent with a disruption of a self-system, um, of an inner system related to self-processing. It's temporary, of course. Uh, these effects were only lasting for minutes to maybe up to 20 minutes, and then they go back to baseline. But interestingly, a uh, sense of time was distorted. Um, events from the past changed, so they tended to see more events from the past, but subjects reported um, basically that even though they were seeing events from the past, they weren't sticking. Um, so what we call equanimity in the lab perhaps was happening, and a sense of ego loss was significantly reported. Now, of course, if you look at the other side, these were not negative effects, right? So. Uh, the sense of ego loss, for example, was not nearly the size that you might affect, uh, expect from a psychedelic study, but there was some change in the inner system, I think, is more of what they were reporting. So uh, this is quite interesting to us and is now serving as the basis for meditation enhancement studies that uh, we're running now, but really shows for the first time that a non-invasive modulation of the default mode network uh, does tend to lead to changes in inner uh, self-processing that are temporary um, and that go back to baseline after about 25 minutes. Um, finally, the last study I want to talk about is a, a one we did back in 2016 um, in collaboration with Shenzhen Young, a uh, meditation teacher. And uh, we got really interested in this disorder of consciousness called athymhormia. Um, athymhormia, it's a very interesting motivation disorder where you have bilateral disruption of the uh, head of the caudate nucleus to the prefrontal cortex. It has to be bilateral, though. And what tends to happen is these patients um, have an extreme level of what looks like equanimity to us in the lab or extreme openness to experience uh, to the point where it's a motivation disorder. They actually don't do anything. Um, so there's lots of cases like this patient who um, got a severe sunburn because it, you know, she was sitting in the sun for six hours, and you ask her, you know, why don't you move out of the sun? And she says something like, well, there's perceived pain, but there is no suffering, so what's the point, right? And so, obviously, this is pathological. We don't want to induce something like this in the lab, but we also know from the meditation literature that the head of the caudate is um, altered. The connectivity of the caudate to other areas in the basal ganglia becomes altered with meditation practice. And that becomes uh, the sort of location of change from meditation experience. And so uh, we got really interested in asking whether we could modulate uh, a much lesser, lesser, lesser form. So nothing like athymhormia, but can we give people a taste of some of that equanimity or that openness to experience um, that's consistent with deep meditation practice by, by sonicating uh, the head of the caudate? And so uh, we did this in some very advanced meditators at first um, over uh, a four-day experiment where they were getting placebo in one of those days. And basically, uh, we targeted the bilateral basal ganglia in these um, individuals and asked them to self-report their meditation states. And uh, basically, what we find is that long-term meditators are very high on these meditation scales, not surprising. Um, but after the four days of ultrasound to the basal ganglia, uh, the four sessions, uh, we found a significant increase in decentering, which is perhaps one way to measure um, equanimity, um, although not a great measure. And when we did self-report measures on these participants, um, when they got the real stimulation, we had them write a paragraph of their subjective experience. And so this is just kind of a fun way to sort of look at the overall words that they used. And uh, what you tend to see is uh, there was a significant body effect, uh, which might be expected, um, but tended to be peaceful, happy, flow, vibratory, a bit of dissociation happening, but it was positive for people. And really, um, overall, they experienced what we might call a sort of body equanimity, sort of an openness to the states in the body, um, which is actually what we were predicting based on the meditation literature. Um, so again, targeting a deep structure in the brain, this is the basal ganglia at the head of the caudate, we were able to produce at least self-reported subjective states in the direction of deep uh, meditation practice. Um, let's see, I think I'm out of time here. So uh, there's the conclusions for you. Uh, the neural correlates of consciousness are important. 
but have not led to a convergence for theory, likely due to limitations of correlational methods like fMRI and EEG. Um, to advance the science, we are pushing for the neural causes of consciousness uh, using brain stimulation to cause temporary, but of course safe changes in brain activity, and measure the causal effects on conscious states and contents. Uh, transcranial ultrasound is an ideal candidate for studying the neural causes of consciousness, um, but this method needs improvement to reach the level of specificity that I really think we need uh, to advance the field. All right, these are all the collaborators on this work. And thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jay, for the...